man wrote, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, Proverbs 3, 5. The effort this week is to discover something. We're going to try to find out the difference between being a church member and a child of God. And that takes an investigation of the question, is my heart in? So whatever we are studying, we can ask that about that particular subject. This morning I want to ask us the question, is my heart in the crucifixion? I saw a, cru a cartoon years ago, a preacher is preaching on the crucifixion. A little boy in the audience is crying. And the caption reads, from the mother, hush, you've heard this before. I wonder sometimes if we can listen to the crucifixion and think, well, I've heard this before. In fact, brothers and sisters and friends, we're fond of saying Jesus died for our sins. That's comforting to us, but it's only half of the story. It's only half of the truth. And half-truths don't tell the whole thing. It is the case that He died for us, but He actually died instead of us. He took our places on that cross. That terrible, terrible torture called crucifixion. Crucifixion did not begin with the Roman Empire. It began with the Persians who used just a stake, and they would tie the victim to the stake. When Alexander the Great conquered the Persians and the rest of the known world, he took that practice around his empire of tying criminals and others he wanted to put to death to a stake. The Romans, however, developed this system into a great method of torture. They knew that the victim on the cross would be in the most exquisite, extreme, horrible pain possible. Contrary to what medieval painters have painted for us, nobody ever carried a whole cross to the crucifixion site. The stake was always in the ground there. The criminal or victim was required to carry a patibulum, a 110-pound cross piece, to the crucifixion site, but never the whole cross. And contrary to what medieval painters have painted for us, no one ever put a nail through the center of the palm of the hand. If you'll touch the bottom of the hand, right there, there's a little indentation that's right on top of the carpal tunnel. And when that nail went through that part, it went through the median nerves encased in the carpal uh, tissue. And every time the victim moved, every nerve in his body screamed with pain. But our master's suffering did not begin on that cross. Look at the 22nd chapter of Luke with me as we think about what happened to him that night. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and in an amazing event, angels come to strengthen him. Why? It was his habit, or want, as the King James has it, his custom, to go to this garden to pray. And as he's in prayer, he asks the Father, if it be willing, if he be willing, remove this cup from me. The Lord knew it wasn't possible, but his humanness comes through to us in that prayer. He knew he was about to bear the weight of the sin of the entire human race. That's quite a load for one human being. And as he prays, an, an, an unusual thing happens. It says in verse 44 here, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I asked my medical doctor's son what that could possibly be. He said it, it's a description of something called hematidrosis. Hema, the Greek word for blood, so I knew it had something to do with blood. 
He said, when a person is in tremendous trauma, and our Lord was at this moment, psychological trauma, it's possible for the capillaries under the skin to break and the blood comes out the pores of the skin. I said, what happens to a person in that situation? He said, normally they go into shock and most people die at that point. I think that's why, I think that's why this angel had to come and strengthen him. His suffering is now at a point where he is in shock. In the second place, that's the point at which he's arrested illegally. It was illegal for the Jews to arrest one of their own on a holy day. This is Passover week. It was illegal for the Jews to arrest one of their own at night. It's night. It was illegal for the Jews to arrest one on the word of one, his own gang. Judas is the one who reported him. It's illegal. And everything they do to him from now on is illegal. In fact, they take him first to Annas, who was deposed by the Roman Empire as the legal high priest. But the Jews still thought of Annas as the legal high priest, even though Annas had stolen tremendous amounts of money from the temple. In order for you to buy an animal in the temple, you had to exchange your Roman denarii for shekels, temple money. You couldn't take Roman money there. That would profane the temple, so to speak. And so as Jesus watched the money changers charging their fellow Jews, he got very angry because that was against the law of Moses to make such an exchange in the first place. And in the second place, it says something about the hearts of those Jews who were doing this to their brother Jews. And so he got very angry, remember? But that's what they were doing, was exchanging their money for shekels. Well, interestingly enough, Annas made money off of that. In fact, in today's market, he would have become a multimillionaire. When the Romans found out about his extortion practices, they deposed him. But one of his own family was put in his place, his, his nephew Caiaphas. And Caiaphas then was the legal high priest. But these Jews took him first to Annas. How would you like to be arrested this morning and taken immediately to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Would you think there was something strange about that? It's illegal. You have to be taken to a lower court first. Jesus should have been taken to the lowest member of the Sanhedrin first. He wasn't. Why the lowest member? Well, once Annas made his decision, the lowest member would have to go along with it. What they were doing to him was illegal. They didn't do anything correctly. But it's interesting, my Lord's attitude as he teaches me how to react in the face of such arrogance, such illegality, and such human evil. He doesn't say a word about it. They take him to Caiaphas and then the whole Sanhedrin. And they mock him. They spit in his face. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, John 1, 12. He's now in shock, and he's been up all night. And the Jews who wanted him to suffer took him to Pilate because they were so envious of our master. They could have stoned him. It wouldn't have been legal, but it wouldn't have been so torturous. They hated him so badly, they wanted him crucified. When you read the account in Luke of that crowd as Pilate confronts them, and they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him, read it the way it's written. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I know from the chant that's recorded there that that crowd was being led by somebody or someones to ask for this torture for the Son of God. Crucify him. Pilate did not want to do that. His wife had already warned him about this one. He had no choice because Pilate was a political coward. Aren't you glad we don't have any of those around today? Pilate wanted to please the crowd. He knew if there was a riot in Jerusalem, it would get back to Rome and he would be deposed as the procurator of that particular region. And so he does not know what to do with him until he hears he's a Galilean. 
I'll send him to Herod Antipas. You remember who that is. That's the fellow whose brother's wife's, uh oh, now Antipas' wife, had John the Baptizer beheaded. Mm -hmm. Antipas is curious about Jesus. In fact, he's a little bit afraid because evidently he thought this might be John the Baptizer reincarnated or resurrected. And he was a little bit afraid, and he wanted to meet him. And, he, and Jesus goes to him, this Gentile, and says not a word. Jesus can't say a word. It's Holy Week. He can't be talking to Gentiles. And Herod doesn't understand that, but he keeps questioning him. He keeps telling him, do a miracle, do a miracle. A lot of people are curious about God that way. Show me a miracle, and I'll follow you. Hmm. Miracles don't save, folks. The gospel does. You can see every miracle you want. You may still forget God. I remember when the Jews walked across the Red Sea, just a few weeks later they built a golden calf. What happened? What did they forget? That doesn't save you. Don't be asking God for a miracle. And even an adulterous generation seeks a sign, and that's exactly what Herod was doing. Give me a miracle. Give me a miracle. Jesus doesn't open his mouth. Herod and his men taunt him. They want to see his trick. And he's not going to do it for them. They put a robe on him and mocked him and sent him back to Pilate. Everything the Romans did, according to Chandler in his book, The Trials of Jesus, and Chandler was a lawyer who investigated the Roman system, he said, tells us that was all illegal. They had nothing there they were doing. This is a kangaroo court trying my master. Sent back to Pilate. Pilate has one other thing he wants to try. He knows they have a custom there in Jerusalem that every holy day they release a prisoner. He has two in his custody. One is Barabbas. The other is Jesus, Jesus. The crowd screams for Barabbas. And brothers and sisters, make a note to yourself, mental or written down, this is the greatest irony in the whole course of human events that takes place here. Think about the name of the man who was exchanged for Jesus. Bar, Aramaic word for son. Abbas, Avas, Aramaic word for father. A man whose name meant the son of his father was physically exchanged for the son of God. This son of his father needed the son of God to make an exchange for him. And when you read about Barabbas in your Bible from now on, just stop a moment and reflect on the fact of his name. That's as iron ironic as it gets in human history that this happened. And then a most unusual event in the third place. Let's look at John 19.1. Pilate, this political coward, is so intent on pleasing the cow, crowd that the Bible says Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Of course, Pilate didn't do that himself. His soldiers did. How long did it take you to read that? Two seconds? Did you ever stop right there and think about what they did? He's already suffered hematidrosis. Shock. He's been up all night. Illegally tried everywhere he turned. Spit on. Slapped. Mocked. Then they scourged him. Now I've heard preachers say, evidently without historical research, that the Roman soldiers would put pieces of glass or sharp pieces of metal in the end of their whips. They never did that. That was done by the Persians and Greeks, never by the Romans. The Romans learned a different technique. They put lead balls in the end of those pieces of leather. And the scourger's job was to beat the back of the victim until the scourger could see the back of the lungs. And then the man was scourged. Most people died. The Lord did not. They put that robe back on him. 
bloody mess. In tremendous agony. In shock. Dead tired. And one of the most evil men who have, has ever lived formed a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Put a reed in his hand and they began to say, Hail, King of the Jews! With their lips curled probably in a sneer. Someone took that reed out of his hand and hit him over the head with it and drove those thorns deeper into his scalp. You fellas ever cut yourself shaving, you know how vascular the skin is on your face. They ripped the robe off. You ever take a bandage off an open wound? Put that 110 pound cross piece across his back and ordered him to walk to the place of the skull, the crucifixion site, in the fourth place. About 10 to 14 days prior to this, a North African probably kissed his wife goodbye and got his two sons and headed for Jerusalem. He would come three times a year, being a good Jew, for the holy days. It was now Passover. He got his sons Rufus and Alexander and went on his way to Jerusalem. Only this time when he came into the city something was different. He was hearing the people say they're crucifying Jesus. And somehow this man worked his way to the front of the audience so he could see what was happening and he saw this very beaten, bloody, Jewish man with a 110 pound cross piece across his back stumble. And a Roman soldier grabbed this fellow and said, go help him. And Simon the Cyrene comes into our name, into our minds from history. I don't know whether Simon ever was saved. I do know he helped my Lord that day. Carry that cross piece to Calvary. In the fifth place, they laid him on his back, put those nails into the palm of his hands, one to the right, one to the left, raised the cross piece on top of the stake and nailed it there, pushed his knees to a 45 degree angle and turned his feet right on top of the left, flat against that post, sometimes breaking the ankles. They drove a nail through the top of his feet into that post, and in the feet again are the median nerves. So whether he moved his hands or he moved his feet, his body was screaming in pain, and he could not breathe out because he was sagging. Because of something Pilate did, we have the form of the cross as our symbol of Christianity. Pilate made a sign in three languages, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. This is the king of the Jews. That sign, unbeknownst to Pilate, and ironically that old evil fellow, gave us our cross. Because Jesus was on it. And he can't breathe. Not out. And his body begins to fill, his blood does, with carbon dioxide. He can't breathe out. But amazingly, when that happens in your bloodstream, your body convulses. And the convulsions pushed the victim upward. And in one of those moments when he could breathe, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let me say something to you that are visiting this morning. If this is your first time in the Church of Christ, or worshiping with us as the Church of Christ, the first time, understand something. You cannot be saved in answer to prayer. You might have an opportunity in answer to prayer to hear what to do to be saved. But nobody was saved the moment Jesus prayed that prayer. But I know if you'll look at the Bible with me when they were given the opportunity to be forgiven for what they did that day. 
Would you take a moment, it, you deserve this for yourself, you deserve to do this, to take a look at what it takes to have your sins taken away by the blood of Christ. He's on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I know exactly when those folks were given the opportunity to hear the answer to that prayer. Look at Acts 2 with me. And notice verse 36. That same crowd had crucified Jesus, but God had made him Lord in Christ. And when that same crowd heard that, they said, what should we do? Look at verse 38. I hope you're asking that question this morning. What should I do? Repent. Make a decision this morning to do whatever God tells you to do. That's repentance. It's based on the fact that you should be sorry for what you've done to God. Godly sorrow causes repentance, 2 Corinthians 7, 10. Make that decision this morning to do whatever God tells you to do, and He will tell you, tell someone with your lips, your mouth, that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then do what Peter told that crowd to do. Be immersed for the remission of your sins. It's in that moment when you will come in contact with the very death of Christ. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know what to do. Another time when he could gasp for breath, he saw his mother there and the disciple John. And he said, John, behold your mother. Take her home and take care of her. It's amazing to me that in the middle of all of that grief and agony and suffering, he can barely breathe. He's thinking about his mother. Tells me something about the way he loves. And he said, Mother, behold your son. Take him home as your son, Mother. He's going to take care of you. Two thieves, one on either side, had been railing against him. One of them repented, evidently, because he said to the Master, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And in that moment when he could gasp, Jesus, gasp, he, Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, not heaven, paradise, one of the compartments of Hades, where all souls go who are saved, and where the Lord went for three days, and the thief with him who had repented. Toward the end of the suffering and the anguish and all that pain and agony and blood, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. One of the most mistaught statements in all of the church is right there. I've heard preacher after preacher say that God turned his back on Jesus at that moment when he cried out, Why hast thou forsaken me? If that's the case, Isaiah was totally wrong in what he prophesied. Isaiah said, Isaiah 53, 11, that the Father would see the travail of his son and enjoy it. Why? He sent him to do that. The reason behind that statement that God turned his back on Jesus at that moment is that people think Jesus became sin on the cross. If he did, you and I don't have a Savior. It took a perfect man to atone for our sin, not a sinner. When Adam sinned in the garden, he was perfect before he sinned. God's justice came into play then. And God demanded a perfect sacrifice. That's why the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. They aren't perfect. He was. And he did not become sin on the cross. He became the sin offering. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Who knew no sin. Paul's very careful to let us know there was no sinner here. And then they say, well, since Jesus became sin, God's of pure eyes and to look upon evil... Habakkuk 1.13, and because he can't look at it, he had to turn his back on Jesus. Come on, folks. What would you think of a God who sent you to do something, and then when you did it, he turned his back on you? What is Jesus doing there? He's identifying with us. He's quoting Psalm 22.1. And if you'll drop down to verse 23 of Psalm 20, uh, 22, you'll see, He hath not hid his face from you. I know there are times in life when I feel this despair. My Lord felt it. He was in the deepest moment of his despair. He was dying. All of that blood running down his face. All of that blood running down his back. He's dying. He's in despair. And that's the moment when he said, Keith, I understand. 
You can feel like this. But God said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Our master said just a few minutes later, it is finished. Father, well, if the father turned his back on him, it was only for a minute because he's talking to him again. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Would you look at John 10 with me for a moment? Let's look at verse 17. Here's an amazing moment for the only one who could do it. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. I might take it again. Why did he have to do that? The wages of sin is death, folks. He's not a sinner. The only way he can die is to will himself to death. You have authority to do that, Jesus? Look at verse 18. No man taketh it from me. Not the Jews, not the Roman nails, not the cross, not the agony, not the suffering. But I lay it down to myself. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. My Master, for all of His love, His care for me, said, Keith, I'm willing myself to death for you. I'm giving you everything I have right at this moment. It's finished. If you're looking for another way to be saved, if you're looking for another Savior, there isn't one. He's it. He's the truth. He's the life. He is all of it. And no man comes to the Father except by Him. John 14, 6. Is your heart in the crucifixion this morning? If you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, it isn't. The only way to contact His death is in baptism. Immersion, you have to be buried with Him. Listen to Paul, do you not know that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? Why His death? It's where He shed His blood. In one of the most heinous moments in history, a soldier came and shoved a spear into the side of Jesus. And the Bible says, forthwith there came out blood and water, both elements necessary for salvation, John 19, 33. I asked my medical doctor, son, did that spear kill Jesus? He said, no, Dad, the reason that John tells us it's blood and water is the heart sack broke. My master willed him to self to death with a broken heart for me, for you, and you contact that death in baptism. It requires penitence on your part prior to that baptism. It requires a confession with your lips. But once you're immersed into him with that mindset of being penitent, you have contacted the death of Christ, and God will put you into the church of Christ at the same moment. You can't join the church of Christ. You have to be added to it by the Lord once you obey the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I've been privileged to be in seven different foreign countries. Over my time of preaching, it's a great privilege, great honor. But when I come back to the United States, I am, excuse the expression, disappointed. The excitement about being God's children isn't here anymore in the United States, in most places. The desire to know about the death, burial, and resurrection and to tell others about it has been forgotten. I'm wondering out loud this morning, are my brothers and sisters' hearts in the crucifixion? Maybe the whole church needs to repent while we stand, while we sing.